I think, I think the fact that um, <clears throat> it was that moment in history, um, um, the fact that we were the age we were, so that, that, that moment of finding out sort of who you are. And um, I mean, something I remember really clearly was that um, the election in which Jimmy Carter became president. And people were really tortured about what they were going to do. And, um, and what was interesting was that um, in that election, everyone returned to type, no matter what people said. And um, it was really hard to talk to both Mark and my partner, who is still my partner, because they'd gone into the booth. You know, I was voting for the third party candidate. And um, Mark said it was so stressful. I mean, you were online forever. And if you remember that the person in front of you came out of the voting booth and said, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> that was the person before Mark. Huh. And, um, you know, and everybody went in and voted the way their mothers would have, is um, what I said. So, you know, my League of Women Voters, um, you know, mother-in-law's person went in and voted Democrat after all, and, you know, Mark voted... Um, for Kissinger. <laughs> I voted for Kissinger. I'd been in the Middle East uh, for four years, and I, the peace process was... The, you'll have no memory of this unless you took a history class. But uh, Kissinger was doing shuttle diplomacy. He was back and forth between uh, warring parties, and there was great hope. <laughs> Uh, how naive and young we were, but uh, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, imagine passing that task off to to someone else. So, but the, the, it, but there was that tension between how we were raised, how things had been done, how we had been taught, how we had <coughs> been taught to teach, and then trying to do something else. And there was always that push and pull. But it was a time of of flux and. Um, when um, and I was draft counseling at the time, and you know people were very very active um, and had these other lives, and you know during the period when we we started being flown around to give talks because this book really was changing everything, and then I was being flown around to talk about how to form a TA union, um, so there was just this sense of Michigan being the place and. We were being asked to talk about what we'd done there, and um, but it was um, but it was that sense of possibility because, in fact, um, you know, the old world didn't make any sense, and it was falling apart of its own weight. Um, hmm. So, um, you know, when you started college, um, the first year there were parietal hours. That is to say that you know, uh, people of the opposite gender could only come to your room in certain hours and you had to have a book in the doorway or something. And that just, you know, by year two, that was gone. And so there was this extraordinary youth culture that really had a kind of power. And I think the youth culture probably fed into our sense of, you know, we could do whatever we wanted to. Mm -hmm. and that, uh, or agency or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the... Uh, the uh, sense of possibility, the uh, energy, and so forth. And it, it was interesting. Michigan was uh, in the middle of the country. I, I came from Denver, but we had been in the Middle East. Sandy came from New York. There were people from all over, and they came here and uh, were attracted to Michigan because of what Michigan was, what the LI was, and so forth. And I think uh, uh, it's hard to separate the factors, but a convergence of historical issues and so forth. And uh, I remember Ellen Bober, one of our co-authors, uh, saying that she remembered the day that Doug Brown uh, had been, was hired, that Ron Wardoff, the director, came, she said, skipping into the ELI ebullient with the fact that they had landed this young Californian from Illinois, he'd just gotten his degree, and he was ecstatic that they had this, they, they managed to, to, to hire him, and so forth. And then he became the, one of the seminar professors that led our section of the of Reader's Choice, and he was my he, he dissertation. He did our section. Oh, well, he, he led the, uh, he led the, uh, the seminar, and, uh, uh, 
was also my dissertation advisor, and he was young. He was young, and he was around, and uh, he also was uh, publishing, writing books, and, and working on materials and so forth. I think there was a uh, sort of a collegiality with senior people. I mean, were, people's expertise was recognized and deferred to because they were good, because what they were doing was good and they had something to offer, less than a person with a title or a particular. Yeah, you had to earn our respect. <laughs> and it was, I think there was a, a flow, a flow. I think that there was, it was, the same could be said of the professors. They, they put up with a lot because there was something coming out of it. It was, it was a, an authentic uh, productivity. So I think, I think, um, it does go back. Uh, Sandy called it the architecture, mm -hmm. but I think it was it, it was the architecture was the physical space. There was also the time we spent together. Then there were the uh, the discourse, the the, uh, the floating of ideas. You could almost feel the the energy flowing up and down the halls. And uh, they said um, yesterday that the the question that you ask in DA is why this, why here, why now, and that I think this is answering that question, you know, why these ideas, why <clears throat> there, why now. The other thing is that Michigan has this sense of self, you know, whether or not it's, 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 it's justified, that, that, that self-fulfilling prophecy of, um, of quality, um, you know, it's like, you're at Michigan, you know, and um, I, I, af after ELI, I went to teach women's studies, which was similar you know, where the graduate students were doing all the cutting edge research and the faculty members were still sort of intellectually trapped in disciplines, but there was this profoundly interdisciplinary work being done by the graduate students. And um, when I left for um, Seattle, one of, the, um, one of the faculty members there said that, you know, she, her, her partner was from that part of the world and she wanted to move back, but there was no there there. And, um, but there was always a there at Michigan. Um, and, um, and you were told constantly that not only were you at Michigan, which was wonderful, but you were of Michigan. So you were being invited into this community. Suddenly you had this identity if you've never had one before. And um, it's actually an awfully good strategy for you know, building energy and um, collegiality and, and, and of course, um, a kind of loyalty. And Joan Morley, by the way, is a big part of that, you know. I mean, you after you left, you'd meet Joan and she would give you a U of M pin to wear, <laughs> you know. Um, so um, it's, uh, I mean, we were very lucky to, mm -hmm. I mean, I think you came with more um, uh, sort of uh, agency and focus to Michigan. I, I stumbled here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually thought it was in a different part of the country than it tur <laughs> turned out to be. Well, isn't it, uh, I mean, that's sort of apocryphal, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing about the Hudson being uh, oh, it's the West. Oh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. The, um, the, the New Yorker cover where the New Yorker Center of Geography has, you know, the Hudson River and stuff in the middle and then California. Yeah. And um, they actually didn't teach geography in public schools when I was a kid. No, because you're, you're in the center you, of you the world. There. There's yeah. no need. <laughs> right. Well, the, uh, the English Language Institute uh, was a model. I mean, the, yep. the way it was set up and the inspiration, the, the enjoyment, the, the, the pure, unalloyed uh, uh, enjoyment of other cultures and other yeah. people and so forth, the great potlucks. You know, you get these uh, students from different yeah. parts of the world competing with their dishes, I mean, it is, uh, you can't beat that. And then uh, pe most of us had lived abroad, had studied languages, had envisioned ourselves as expa expatriates at some point or other. So there was a, a true um, uh, sense of participation in a global uh, community, a global mission. And the, um, at, it was also true that not long before, or around the same time that we were coming to Michigan, TESOL was forming as a professional organization. It had been part of NCTE. There was a group of teachers, National Council of Teachers of English, who were interested in uh, working with English language learners, and they had formed a subgroup of, of the larger organization. 
and I believe it was 1967, somewhere in there, where mm-hmm. uh, Virginia French, Allen, Betty Walsh Robinette, Jim Alatus, uh, Russ Campbell, Don mm-hmm. Bowen, I forget all these yes. people mm-hmm. who were giants in the field when we arrived. Uh, probably now they're studied as ancient history, but uh, they broke off and, and formed TESOL. And so the, the uh, ELI in the early part, earlier part of the century was the place where uh, English language teaching got its, um, got its birth, and then another iteration, rebirth, you could say, as TESOL became the preeminent international organization in the emerging era um, of English language teaching. And it, uh, it was a, a, a true phenomenon. I think EL, the ELI, Michigan people, can be seen at every stage of that development and TESOL was uh, a truly interdisciplinary organization. You could go to one session at a convention which was about some arcane element of language or linguistics and so forth, and then walk in to the next session and see how puppets might be used to uh, entice students to learn the language. And it was that combination of uh, theory and practice, and, and theory informing practice, and practice informing theory that was a a very sort of egalitarian and uh, collegial dialogue going on that I see as representing what was happening at, uh, at Michigan and uh, which got carried out into the, into the world. And eventually um, the researchers <coughs> broke <coughs> off and formed AAAL and um, the, the practical stuff um, got to be silly you know, there was a hundred ways to use the overhead projector was a title that that was the the last um, convention where they where they allowed something like that to happen. But the, the point is that there was the the split did happen at at the um, um, at the international level, and it happened um, here too, I think, um, because you know I was very much ensconced in the um, in, in the linguistics department. And I did my dissertation on discourse analysis, so that you know I've always published in both areas, and you know I publish in um, media coverage of war and terrorism now. That's what I do, but um, but I'm always working on the textbooks. Um, but um, the linguistics department and the ELI stopped having this, the same sort of strength of connection. Um, the, the field wasn't quite sure what the relationship between theory and practice was. Um, so, I mean, that was, and, and I think we also lost a sense of the history. I mean, what's interesting is when you hear Fries talked about and, and you hear Peter Fries talk, um, he really understood the relationship of theory to practice. And um, he was, I mean, he also founded that linguistics department, which we don't talk about. and. Um, and, and he was trying to understand, um, you know, both language and then how it was acquired and then how it was taught. And that synergy um, not only was lost, but I think the history of that synergy has been lost. So. Mm-hmm. I guess, I mean, one thing I, 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 that I talked about yesterday that I think should be sort of on record was um, and it's implicit in everything we're saying that this, that that these sort of major changes in um, how people saw applied linguistics and language teaching were very much from the ground up. They were really practitioner driven, and um, oftentimes when students go on the job market now from a Matessal degree, you know they'll say, "Oh, is that degree all theory, um, all research?" And, um, and there's this, this implication that some theorist somewhere comes down and forces people to do various things in the classroom. And um, that shift from, um, from, from audiolingualism to something more communicative or more cognitive, um, now we'd say based in neuroscience, um, really happened on the ground because ALM of, of of itself only um, didn't work for teachers. It wasn't the caricature that we think of now, that is to say um, there was a lot of playfulness, there was a lot of content, there was a lot of culture, um, people could talk about themselves, but nonetheless, um, having no reading, 
you know, having no writing, um, having having most of your time drilling, um, the sort of um, obsessive concern with uh, mistakes, um, and not with communication. Um, it just um, it didn't make sense, and. Um, and so it was the teachers themselves who, who sort of um, um, created the shift that went from that to something that was more communicative. And, um, and when I came, this is a story I, I have not told, um, jo when Joan Morley and Mary Lawrence were off for the summer, you were not allowed to use the classroom testing versions of their textbooks. So um, that meant that you were stuck, in fact, with the rainbow books and, um, or something else. So the, the first class I was assigned to was a speaking and listening class for all Japanese speakers. And we tried to figure out how to make El Sonoris because we all came from non-L and R dialects. And we'd look at the... Um, the charts and we look at the book and we just kind of laughed and finally gave up. You know, I didn't know how to make, I mean, I may John Morley tell me how to do those in later years, but the fact of the matter is that we're all understood, you know, who cares if a Japanese speaker produces something that's, that sounds exactly, supposedly like <laughs> a native speaker of English. But if you watch those old films, and there's one here at Michigan, but there's also one at Georgetown, people are badgered. I mean, it borders on real cruelty, having to say the same sound over and over and over again, the same way, um, when it was perfectly comprehensible. So, um, I mean, that was what the classroom teacher understood, <clears throat> that they didn't want to be enablers of this kind of behavior. And so there was um, this shift. And, so um, I, I give a lot of credit to the, the people who came just before us, who in a sense had the courage to know that even though they were at the center of the universe and they had the answer. And if you watch those, those early films, you know, there they, they really was an answer. And we had it at Michigan. And it was audiolingualism. And it was habit formation. And errors were dangerous. And um, to, to, they, they gave up a lot. Um, they gave up having the answer in order to shift towards um, a research paradigm that is still ongoing.